Good morning and welcome to worship. Uh, I'm sorry that we couldn't meet together face to face. However, uh, it is still very icy out there and nasty and we've only had one vehicle go by the house this morning. So uh, and that was spreading salt. So uh, we are thankful that uh, we're able to do this. It's a bit interesting because in the past when it was a question as to whether or not we ought to have uh, services, Honestly, those are some of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make in ministry to shut the church down. But since we do have the uh, uh, the Facebook opportunity uh, and we've been doing that anyway, it, it really uh, was a much easier decision and, uh, uh, and, and clearly was the right decision. So uh, we're thankful that you're tuning in now. Uh, do have some prayer concerns and... Uh, a couple of announcements, so wanted to make the, those clear. We have um, in the list my sister Robbie and her neighbor Sarah, uh, the uh, families of those who have lost loved ones in the recent past, uh, Linda Vandermark, the Milligan family, and Brenda Iyer. Um, also, we want to continue to lift up Eleanor Irway's son because of uh, his experiencing <laughs> eye issues still. And so we ask you to keep him in prayer. His name is Philip. Um, family of Dave Thomas, uh, that friend of mine who had died from COVID. Glenn Alpow and Lee Ward is back at work and doing well, so we're very thankful. We'll pray for his lungs, though. But pray for his lungs to continue to heal. Uh, Steve, Georgia is out of the hospital in, re in rehab now, and we are so thankful for that. So uh, continue to lift Steve up. I think he is still in a, a great deal of pain but uh, but things are are uh, um, are going better for sure. Also, uh, I had a call from Ed Vandermark and his son and grandson, uh, Dan and Aiden Vandermark, are suffering from COVID. They just came down with it, so if you kind of lift them up, that would be great. And for Ed um, that he doesn't catch it. And and for Ed that he doesn't catch it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Millie Yakey. Uh, who is a neighbor of Ed's, is 88, and she fell and broke a hip. So we would ask you to pray for her. And um, a couple of unnamed concerns. Uh, one is a member's brother and uh, who just went through some significant surgery and is waiting to see exactly how that turned out. So I would appreciate prayers for him. Um, and prayers for Ken and Mel. Uh, Mel was uh, on Facebook yesterday and she lost, uh, and Ken lost three friends yesterday. Uh, three friends died yesterday, and that's just hard to imagine. So um, as we go through these uh, difficult times together. My brother-in-law, Terry, too. And, uh, and also uh, we would ask for prayers for Kathy's uh, sister's husband, our brother-in-law, Terry Ford, who is going through some stuff right now. So uh, if you can lift them up, that would be great. If you have some other folks you'd like on the list and you would like to put them down in your comments in response to the video, uh, this or the Facebook post here, uh, that would be great and we will get them on for sure. Um, so having said that, I would invite you to join with me now in worship and um, we're going to uh, together say the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed is one of the oldest creeds of the Christian church. Uh, it was created in the Council of Nicaea and, uh, and basically was, as most creeds have been, were designed to create unity and to um, point out where true Christianity stood relative to any number of heresies that attacked uh, in the early church. And so we have as our creed statements of what we believe about God. And, uh, and so this is one of the uh, great ones. It is probably has a little more about the Holy Spirit. We're, we're getting off now onto a theme uh, of preaching and uh, services. We're going to be back on the Holy Spirit for a while. Um, so the uh, Nicene Creed, if you have a hymnal at home, it's on 880. Uh, hopefully you've had the chance to run off a copy of the uh, service which was emailed to you. And if you're not getting that, let me know and we'll get you plugged into that system. So let us enter into worship together. 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, our first hymn is Sweet, Sweet Spirit. And uh, hopefully, uh, if you don't have a hymnal, uh, you will know this one well enough to sing along anyway. If not, I'm sure we can all hum and, and uh, that would be fine as well. come through and <laughs> clear the road. <laughs> but we'll have a sweet, sweet spirit. But no, we will have a face. sweet, sweet spirit in this place, <laughs> for sure. I would invite you to join with me now as we engage in a time of prayer. Lord, as we uh, are gathered in our homes and watching this on uh, Facebook or maybe later on YouTube, uh, whatever, uh, we know that we are safe and secure here, but we also know that there are folks out there who are working today in various ways. Some just simply trying to get the roads open back up and get the ice broken down and thereby to save people's lives. And Lord, we are thankful for the ministry that uh, they are doing in our name. And Lord, we ask that you would keep us mindful of that and that you would remind us to keep them in prayer. We lift up to you those names that we've mentioned and others that are unnamed concerns. Lord, as you work in the lives of those that we love and in our lives, we give you thanksgiving and praise for all that you do. You reach and you touch us. You bring us healing and wholeness. You bring us spiritual healing and wholeness. 
And Lord, you do it out of your great and profound love for every single one of us. We pray that our response would be a response of love to you. And Father, we ask you in this day to fill us anew with your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would be at work in us to bring us closer to yourself, to keep us mindful of the needs that we have, to, uh, to seek you out constantly, not because you're not there, but because oftentimes we get so tied up in our own issues and in our own selves that we forget to turn around or turn to the side or even look ahead and see your mighty presence with us. Help us to be mindful of that, Lord, in each and every situation that we engage in. We ask, Lord, for your guidance and your blessing on our government. We ask that you would give them hearts and minds that are in tune with you and what your desires are. We ask that you would establish your kingdom more and more every day in our hearts, in our lives, and in this nation. It uh, ultimately, Lord, it belongs to you. We belong to you, and we ask you to guide us and comfort us, to strengthen and encourage us, and to bless us as we seek you out and seek to serve you with our lives. Lord, we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our and Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will, will be, be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, the children's message this morning is titled, God is with us. And I... I uh, uh, as we are talking about the Holy Spirit, the the theme is really oriented toward that, that God is indeed with us. Now, I want to ask you, boys and girls, do you have a best friend? Do you have someone that you like to play with more than anyone else or to be with? Do you have someone that when you get up in the morning, you think, boy, I hope I get to play with them? I remember when I was a little boy, and uh, it's been a long time since I was little, uh, I had a friend who lived across the road, and this is before I even started school. And I remember getting up and standing on my bed and looking out the window that was over the bed that I slept in, and looking out at the uh, across the road at my friend's house and asking my mother, and this would have been as my older sister was getting ready to go to school, to kindergarten or first grade, and asking my mother if I could go play with Rich Mason today. And uh, and that was uh, my goal most days was to get together with Rich and play all day. That was something that uh, was like my one of my very favorite things to do. So, Rich, if somehow you're listening to this, uh, here's to you. Anyway, uh, and, and most days that worked out, you know, that I could be with him. And, and, uh, and you know what's interesting about God is that he wants to be with us even more than that. Not just every day when you get up that you uh, look across the street and you see God's house and you go, Oh, I want to go play with God today. I want to be with God today. It's uh, God says, I want to be with you and I don't ever want to be separated from you. So guess what? I will be with you always. And that's the promise that God makes to us. And that's why he sent the Holy Spirit, that, that part of God which is to be with us, for to guide us, to comfort us. You know, sometimes we have a bad day and we need to be comforted. Sometimes we get hurt and we need to be comforted. And, and God wants to comfort us himself. He wants to let us know that he loves us and he's thinking about us. And uh, so for guidance, you know, the Bible tells us how we should be, what we should do, those kind of things. And sometimes God, uh, and you know, points out things to us that we need to do. And so he likes to guide us, he likes to comfort us, and he strengthens us. Sometimes there are things that at your age right now you can't do, but as time goes by and you get older, and you get bigger and you get stronger, you know, those are things you can do. 
Well, the same thing is true in our spiritual lives. God wants us to be stronger there. And so we don't just grow physically. I'm, I'm a lot bigger than I was when I used to play with Rich Mason. But uh, it's not just growth in size, it's growth inside that really makes the difference. And so God sent his Holy Spirit because he wanted to be with us always, never to be separated from us. And, uh, and that was his promise. He will do that for us and will do that in us. And uh, what a wonderful thing it is to serve the God that we serve and to love the God who loves us more than we can even imagine and wants to be with us always. Well, let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. For the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit. Which is your presence. Which is your presence. With us. With us. At all times. At all times. By presence. By presence. We mean that you are with us. You are there. You mean that you are with us. That you are there. And also there's that present. And also there's that present. That we get under the Christmas tree. That we get under the Christmas tree. And, uh, and on our birthday. And on our birthday. And you give us spiritual gifts. And you give us spiritual gifts. As well. As well. Thank you for the presence. Thank you for the presence. And thank you for your presence. And thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, boys and girls. I wish I could send you all suckers, but uh, at any rate... Uh, we uh, come to the time in the service when we talk about the giving of our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. And, and uh, today you will not be able to drop them off in the plates, and the offering plates in the back of the church. Uh, you are welcome to mail them in uh, this week or bring them next week, uh, whatever it works best for you. But uh, again, I, I want to always take time in every service to ask people to bow their heads for a time and consider what it is since the Holy Spirit is with us and God is with us and God has desires for us. What is it that God is asking you from you with the gifts and graces that he's given you to do? And some of that's financial. Of course it is because that's just, you know, that's how it works. And it's been that way ever since back in Genesis. But the really critical part is what are you giving of yourself? What is it that God wants from your heart? What is it that he wants your hands to do? Where is it that he wants your feet to walk? Uh, those are things that uh, really are between every individual and God himself, God who is with us. So I would invite you now to take a moment and uh, open your hearts. And I would suggest you don't pray a word just, you know, other than to say, God, show me what you want from me. So let's bow our heads and do that for a few moments here. Lord, as you progressively reveal to us those things that are your call in our lives, those things that you would have us do and give and be, we ask you to bless us as we respond. Lord, give us a heart that is open to your Holy Spirit, to work in your name, to do your will, that uh, indeed when we stand before you, we might hear those incredible words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, let that be the hallmark of our lives, that we seek to be your people and to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we uh, because the two hymns that uh, on the bookends of the uh, service, as we have been normally doing of late, uh, were so short, I thought, well, let's, let's add one in the middle. And... Um, 
So we are going to do another song uh, that really is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And our request, as we uh, have just done in prayer, let's do in, in song. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. And if you don't have a hymnal and you don't know this one, um, what I would say is listen to the words and own them um, as, uh, as your desire that uh, God would inspire you and receive your gift. Scripture for this morning comes from the book of Acts. It is Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. <clears throat> um, this is, uh, this is a uh, passage which kind of follows 
very shortly after the stoning of Stephen, and Saul has begun his persecution, Saul, who later becomes Paul, has begun his persecution against the church. Now, Philip had been preaching, and Philip was uh, not one of the 12 disciples, but he was a uh, he was one of the disciples, one of the, the larger group who followed Jesus, and immediately uh, after the you know the day of Pentecost, Philip shows up. I mean, he really does, and he's begun preaching in Samaria, and uh, and people have in Samaria. Remember the half Jews; they weren't uh, they were not considered to be fully Jewish or really Jewish at all anymore to the true Jews, you know, because they were. Uh, they had uh, were of mixed blood, but Philip goes there, starts preaching, and people begin to respond big time, and so uh, that's where we kind of pick up on this passage. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me... Now this Simon is a uh, was a magician in Samaria, a very famous guy. And uh, so he that's the Simon we're talking about. Now when Simon saw the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered the money, saying, Give me also this power, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may happen. May God add his blessing to... uh, I actually went a little farther, but uh, at any rate, I think it was uh, good to uh, get all of that in there. Uh, Just a quick comment on Simon to sort of start us out. Um... As I said, Simon was a magician. Now, what he was looking for in uh, asking the disciples to give him the power to, you know, distribute the Holy Spirit, he was looking for power. He was looking for control. He was looking for a way to uh, amaze people. He thought that uh, that was something that he could grasp, and the disciples are aghast at that. And uh, and they make it very clear to him that that's not how things work. And I think it's worth considering that just from the standpoint of uh, the uh, concept of receiving the Holy Spirit, not just giving the Holy Spirit, which is not our job, but rather the Holy Spirit's job to give uh, himself, itself, into the lives of the believers and the followers of Jesus Christ. So... The uh, title today is Receiving the Holy Spirit. As I said, this is going to be a start-up to a series of sermons on the Holy Spirit. A few years ago at annual conference, we were encouraged to make sure that on a regular basis, we uh, spoke about the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's been about a three-year gap now, and it's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm thinking it's definitely time to hit this. Um, as I'm coming down into the last months of uh, a full-time ministry. um, There is nothing I would rather leave you with than an understanding of and an infilling of the Holy Spirit. Because uh, as we open our hearts and our minds to God, that's when that happens. So I would invite you to pray with me now. Lord, as we begin to consider again the whole concept of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world and specifically in our lives, Lord, we ask you to open our hearts, open our lives so that we may receive this incredible gift, this presence of God within us. And uh, Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name and for the sake of his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll repeat myself a little bit here, but uh, 
by the time that this event occurs, a lot of things have happened uh, chronologically. Persecution in the early Christian church had begun by the Jews. They had begun to uh, uh, go after them and uh, for heresy, and uh, they were uh, very uh, concerned about the spread of Christianity. And they were also the people who were in authority in the Jewish kingdom at that point were concerned about the fact that they were losing some of their authority. They were losing some of their power and that was making them nervous. And so persecution had begun. In spite of that, the apostles were preaching and people in the Jewish realm were coming to the Lord in dramatic numbers. Even some of the priests were convinced, as we're told prior to the part that I read, some of the priests in the Jewish realm were coming to the Lord. They were convinced of the Lordship of Christ. We know that uh, you know there were Pharisees who were very interested. Uh, Nicodemus is one that's lifted up. I, ha I have to believe that Nicodemus eventually uh, did come to the Lord. I, I don't know, that's just a personal thing. Um, but he, he keeps um, telling the, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Council, you know, take it easy with these guys, because if it's of God, it's going to go. And if it's not, it'll die on its own. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can tell that Nicodemus is pretty suspicious that this is a movement of God. And, of course, he was right, because we're still here today. And uh, that's, kind of a, that's kind of a telltale sign. The fact that the people were indeed turning to the Lord really did concern the chief priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, most of the religious elite. And so the initial persecution comes from them. First, they try to shut the disciples down. They, uh, they beat them and, and send them back and say, uh, keep your mouth shut, basically. And then they begin to realize that this isn't enough. And so they begin to bring false charges against them. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is what ends up with a first martyrdom. And that is, of course, Stephen. And they bring false charges against Stephen. They get a crew of people to come and lie in front of the uh, chief priests and so forth. And in front of the people. And, uh, and these people uh, bring Stephen in for a trial, and Stephen preaches a, a great sermon, so great that it made everybody really angry, and, uh, and they wind up killing him, the first martyr of the Christian faith. Stephen's death emboldens Saul, uh, our later-day Paul, and he begins his own personal persecutions. He went from house to house, and any time he found somebody who were followers of the way, he had them dragged away to prison. And again, this is in, uh, you know, this is in the Jewish realm, and, uh, and they do have the authority to do that sort of thing. So a follower named Philip, as I've said, perhaps one of the original group who, in addition to the 12 disciples, followed Jesus uh, extensively for a lot, of, uh, a lot of those years. And, uh, and he was clearly raised up by the Holy Spirit, for ministry, and after the persecution began, as the church of Jerusalem began to scatter a little bit because it was really a focused persecution on them, Philip heads for Samaria. And, uh, you know, the, the history of the Samaritans was, uh, uh, was one that was very separate from the Jews. Back in the times in which the uh, Babylonians and the Assyrians came in and took the people out of Israel and Judah. We've been talking about this quite a bit. Um, they, uh, they, were, uh, they left some people behind who were Jews. In the ensuing years, those people began to interbreed with people who were not Jews. And uh, that was, of, of course, just inexcusable. And so when the people who had remained pure in their Jewish heritage through all this time of slavery and all these other things. And as they were coming back, as they were released, as I had said, by the, uh, by the Medes and the Persians eventually, to go back home, even to the point where uh, they're allowed to build a wall around Jerusalem again, 
Nehemiah, check that out in the Old Testament. And uh, as they come back, the Samaritans are there saying, oh, good, you're home, and let's do some good things together, and we want to help with the wall. And they said, you're, you're a bunch of, you know, worthless individuals who couldn't even remain pure, even though you stayed here at home while the rest of us were dragged off into slavery. And uh, that may not seem terribly fair to us, uh, and, uh, but that's the way it was. So the Samaritans were really despised by the Jews. And, uh, and yet, here is where Philip winds up, and bam, there is this ministry, and there is an effect, and, uh, and it gets back to the, the uh, leaders of the church back in Jerusalem. And so um, he was, you know, Philip was there, he was healing. And it, the things that are lifted up in the scripture right before what we read today are interesting because it, speci it speci specifically says that he was casting out demons and he was healing the paralyzed and the lame. You would guess that there were a lot of other healings going on. Those were the things that were very specifically list lifted up. And the result in Samaria was great rejoicing. Now, again, let's jump back. Philip had been filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why he was empowered to do the things that he was doing. He was responsive to the Holy Spirit. That's why he was in Samaria preaching to the Samaritans. You know, it's, uh, it's one thing to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's another thing to be responsive to the Holy Spirit and thereby minister in the name of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so, you know, Philip was the whole package. He was doing what he was supposed to do with what he had been given to work with. And so in Samaria, the result was great rejoicing. Everybody was thrilled, and they began to turn to Christ in large numbers. And it's, you know, they didn't just turn to Philip. They turned to Christ because his preaching was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And as people heard his words, they saw the truth therein, and, uh, and they began to come to Christ. Now, I'm, I suspect that Philip probably was not alone. There were probably some other Christians from Jerusalem who had gone with him and were helpful in that ministry. That usually was a the case. There would be two or three at least. And so we arrive at the beginning of our reading for this morning. The news in Philip's success and in Samaria reaches to Jerusalem, and Peter and John are sent out to go check things out. They've heard good things. They want to see for themselves, get a report uh, in triplicate, no doubt. Probably, uh, you know, uh, with a full signature, you know, the, the, the written part in, in uh, um, printed and then the signature underneath. I mean, it was that sort of significance to them. And so they get there. And they find that the, uh, you know, the results are, if anything, greater than what they had heard. And they're really excited. And so, um, you know, what Philip had been doing to this point was baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But the, um, they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because we can sit in our position today and say, okay, so what did it mean then at that point to receive the Holy Spirit? Interestingly enough, in this passage, we're not told anything at all as to how that manifested itself. However, it, uh, it clearly manifested itself in such a way that Simon the magician was flabbergasted and he wanted some of that. You know, he wanted the power to do that to people. And, and of course, it gets him in trouble. But so, Again, obviously there was an obvious outward response to being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we know on the day of Pentecost what that consisted of. Um, they, were, uh, they had suddenly tongues of fire over their head and they began to speak in other languages that they did not know as the Spirit gave them utterance. Interestingly enough, there were people in Jerusalem from all over the the, uh, the known world at that point in time, and they heard their own languages. So there was a very defined purpose in, uh, in the giving of the gift of tongues at that point, which in some respects we see 
changing up a little bit um, as we go into the uh, into the rest of uh, Acts and uh, and some conversations about speaking in tongues. But at that point, that was one of the things. Did that happen here? I, we're not told. We don't know. But there was something that was so obvious that it it just hit Simon, and man, he was blown away. And the people themselves were really excited. They knew something had happened to them. And uh, they had been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a powerful time in the life of the church as a whole another nation. And isn't it fascinating? Starts out of the Jews, moves to the half-Jews, and then eventually it's going to move out to the Gentiles, to people like you and I. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, it harkens back to, to when Jesus told the disciples ahead of time, um, wait. Now, it isn't like the Holy Spirit hadn't been in work at work in them at other times, because he certainly had when they sent them out two by two, and uh, they went out and they did all kinds of ministry and, uh, and, and really demonstrated authority over Satan's realm. And, uh, and so they had been empowered for that time, but it, has, it was not apparently an empowerment over the whole church or the whole of the followers of Jesus at a level that was going to happen in Pentecost. It would appear that when Peter and John laid hands on the Samaritans and prayed for them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, it was that same kind of infilling that had occurred at Pentecost. So it, it's, uh, you know, it is a, a powerful thing and a powerful time. And, uh, and you know, we see, this, uh, we see this glorious blessing of a whole new branch, if you will, of the church as the Samaritans come to Christ and in, essentially are rejoined with their heritage rejoined with their uh, their position relative to God and and enjoined in the ministry that God was calling the Jews to perform in the world. You know, it, it's easy to look at it and say, well, you know, the, as the Jews did, the, we're God's favorite people. You know, add a story. But the fact of the matter is they were God's favored people for a purpose, and that was to uh, be the element in the world that would maintain a, a purpose and a focus that was going to lead to the coming of Jesus Christ and the salvation of all people in the world who would receive him. And, uh, and so uh, the Samaritans had to wait a while before they were empowered to begin the ministry that God was calling them to. And indeed, in our lives, we need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as well. And that's why uh, this passage is just a wonderful passage to start with in this time. It reminds us of the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It was not optional in order to actually be the church, but it was a necessity you, know, you could be in the church, but you weren't. You weren't the church. You know, you could you could be a follower of Christ, but you weren't empowered to do the ministry until the Holy Spirit had come upon them. Uh, it was necessary enough to pull Peter and John out of Jerusalem on something of a dangerous journey in order to make sure that it happened. We later see Peter going to the home of a Roman centurion in Acts ten, where he preaches to the centurion's household. And they, without any physical contact, are suddenly filled with the Spirit. Again, not uh, not through Peter's laying out of hands, or of uh, or of his baptism even, although Peter does immediately baptize them. And uh, the order is is uh, probably reversed in this case because they are Romans, and God was through that whole story proving something to Peter. In that case, we are told what happens when the Holy Spirit does come upon them. Once again, there's a speaking in tongues, 
but he added extolling God. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Samaritans uh, began to extol God as a part of their response, you know, uh, demonstrated that they had indeed reached a new level of commitment and, uh, and a, a new level of relationship with God. Again, the presence of the Holy Spirit is at work in a church, the body of Christ and its members. It is a critical thing if we really want to be the church. The sermon then is sort of a startup for us because I'm planning on preaching, as I said, on the subject of the Holy Spirit for a while. And, uh, and so it, it's, uh, it, it's important for us to understand who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, and what our response to the Holy Spirit is to be about. One of the things that I am, I, I'm planning on doing is uh, on a Sunday, well, a number of weeks away. We're going to be working on this for a while. Um, we're going to do a, a, uh, a Holy Spirit uh, um, survey, I guess. And you will all have the opportunity to look at things and, uh, and fill out a form that will help point out to you what some of your spiritual gifts may be. Uh, the Holy Spirit is alive and well in the Uyghur United Methodist Church. And we, uh, it's more a matter of us waking up to it, I think, in, in our own lives. I know it has been for me. Uh, and uh, in the not-too-distant past, a new wake-up call from the Holy Spirit came. And, and so um, it's, it's about, again, waking up to the reality of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to receive it, to take it in ourselves and to say, thank you, God, for it, and then to begin to live out of that empowerment so that we can truly be the church, be the body of Christ, be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world around us aware of what it is that he's calling us to do, listening and uh, celebrating and extolling God, as these folks did in Samaria on that day. Well, that's my prayer for us, and uh, that is my goal in uh, looking ahead to the future. Uh, in next uh, next few uh, weeks and maybe even a couple of months, um, we, uh, we will probably work on it some even into uh, into Lent uh, for a while and uh, we're going to be looking ahead to that day of celebration, the day of Pentecost, which is to come. So I hope that you will uh, stick with this and stay focused and, uh, uh, and grow in the Spirit in these days. May it be so. Amen. Well, we have another hymn that we're going to sing, Spirit of the Living God. If you have your hymnal, uh, that is 393. Um, again, it's one of those that is uh, uh, is well well known enough, I think, that most of us can sing it without having the words in front of us. <clears throat> and I, I chose the uh, hymns the way that I did. I don't know why that turns around. Every time I put the guitar down, it goes, spins right around. Um the, you know, the first was, uh, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Recognizing the presence of the Holy Spirit is really the first step. And then the uh, Spirit of God descend upon my heart. That's our first plea, you know, is that the Holy Spirit would fill us, would enter us, would work within us. And then, <clears throat> uh, and then the, the final hymn, Spirit of the Living God, um, recognizing that as as Christians we've received the introduction to the Holy Spirit and we need to renew our commitment to be there and to receive from the Holy Spirit so that's uh, that's kind of the why of the three hymns today but uh, we're gonna finish up with Spirit of the Living God Fill me. 
filled with the Spirit, and may the Holy Spirit direct and guide, comfort and strengthen you in all things, that you may truly be the church in this coming week. Amen. Have a great day. Stay safe, stay warm, and hopefully we'll see you all next Sunday. Bye-bye.